Hello, my name's Rebecca Hill and I'll be doing the Bible reading today. I'll be reading from Ephesians 2, chapter 11 to 22. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at that time, you were separated from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus. You who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with his commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by putting which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near, for through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you were no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets, with Jesus, Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and raises become a holy temple for the Lord and in him you two were being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Good morning, uh, my name's Chris, um, I'm a member of this church, I've been pastors of other church, I was a pastor at um, Parks Baptist Church and it's great to have a member, <laughs> the whole group, very good. Um, lovely to see them joining in fellowship. That's the great thing about being part of churches. We have these connections everywhere. Uh, so great to see them here today. I have the privilege of sharing God's Word. And, and, and I wanted to begin by uh, sharing a, a story that I came across. And I found it very interesting it's, because it's quite revealing about human nature. What had happened is a, a, a university lecturer decided that she would do an experiment with her students. She decided instead of, you know, putting 95 out of 100 or 75 percent or A, B, C, D, you know, ranking their essays, she would put animal stamps. Well, she'd have a giraffe for some, monkey for others. She would have an elephant for another. And then she handed them out. The next morning she walked into her office and there was this argument taking place. It was the students. A group of them had got together and they were arguing about the meaning of the stamps. The giraffe people were saying, the giraffe's the tallest. That must mean we got the highest mark. Oh, no, no, said the monkey people. Monkeys are smart. We must have got the highest mark. No, you're all wrong, said the elephant people. Elephants don't forget. <laughs> now, the, the, you can imagine their disappointment when they found out the stamps had no meaning whatsoever. None. They were just randomly chosen. But it illustrates, and that's what she wanted to do, this tendency that we have as people to rank each other and, and to work out, where, where do I fit in the pecking order? What's my place? And if I'm above a whole group of people, I'm very pleased. If I'm below, well, I'm very upset. I'm sad. That's bad and we get depressed. Our whole society is built on this idea. In fact, the, the whole the capitalism is built on it. So they create products for the different tiers. So we all know who the top tier are by the, the cars they own, right down to the people who have no car at all. So we have all these different ways of finding our place in the order of things. One of the great things about the church is that should never exist amongst us. That is not the church that Christ came to build. In fact, the church that Christ came to build 
goes against all human nature. It is unique. It is new. It has never existed before. And it's been going now for more than 2,000 years. And it will go as long as Christ wants it to go. This morning, we have an opportunity to think about the church that Christ came to build. We've been working our way through Ephesians chapters 1 to 2. Uh, and and uh, the first chapter of Ephesians and the first half of chapter 2 is mainly about the individual walk in Christ. It's about the person and what happens to them, where they've come from, their past, uh, God's plan and purpose for them, the individual. At the end of chapter 2, Paul moves towards, well, what what is his primary concern is those individual Christians gathered together as a church. And so that's what he does. And so what we're doing this morning as we continue this series is looking at in Christ as churches. What's that going to look like? What are the key qualities? I mean, Paul doesn't give us all of them, but he does highlight some important ones. He begins in verse 12 by telling us how this church came about. And it's got some history. It's not brand new. It has some history, but something quite dramatic has taken place. Verse 12, he says to them, Remember referring to a group within the Ephesians church, remember at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope and without God in the world. He's he's referring to the Gentiles, not to the Jews, but to the Gentile believers. Because that was a very strong distinction at the beginning of the church, Jews and Gentiles. Now to understand this, we're going to have to do some background work. Before we can understand what Paul is saying, we need to go, in fact, I would argue, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Oh, sorry, in foreigners to the covenant, the promise without hope and without God in the world. I cut that off short. Adam and Eve and their disobedience of God. One of the outstanding parts of that description for me of Adam and Eve is when God said to them, in particular to Eve, but he was including Adam, what have you done? What have you done? He knew. They didn't. They soon found out. Not only had their relationship with God been almost destroyed, their relationship with each other was severely impacted by the whole event. Within one generation, we had their eldest son, Cain killing his brother Abel within one generation. All you have to do is look at the news and see that that killing and tearing each other apart has never stopped. We've been doing it ever since. When we have a broken relationship with God, the result will always be a broken relationship with each other. Well, thanks be to God, that was not the end of the story. Be a very short Bible, and we wouldn't be here today. It would be hell on earth. But praise to God, that was not the end of the story. He had a plan. And that plan involved a man by the name of Abraham, and then 12 of his descendants who became the 12 tribes of Israel, who became the chosen people of God, the Jews. Everyone else, the Gentiles. See, that's how the Bible describes people. Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were close to God. Oh, were meant to be. The Gentiles were far away. One of the ways this was symbolised was in the temple, there was a dividing wall. And only Jews could pass through that wall, not Gentiles. And there was a sign on the wall and it said to this effect, it didn't say trespassers will be prosecuted, it said to the effect trespassers will be executed. That's a severe wall to have in your temple building. 
And the reason why that wall was there and the reason why there was this distinction between the Jews and the Gentiles is the Jews had a very important job to do. They were meant to be close to God, to know him, to be transformed by him so that they could reflect the goodness and greatness of God to the nations. They failed miserably. It was also like, almost like Adam and Eve all over again, but just on a bigger scale, a whole nation failed to fulfil their role to lead the Gentiles to God. But where the Jews failed, Christ, our Lord, succeeded. He succeeded. He was able to bring the Gentiles near to God, close to him. As Paul goes on to explain, the Gentiles were separate, excluded, without hope, without God, and then verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. He goes on, verse 14, for he, referring to Christ, himself is our peace, which has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Remember that wall down the temple? It's gone because of Jesus. There is no longer this separation between Jews and Gentiles. He's made the two one. One new group. And then, then Paul explains how this happened. Verse 15, by abolishing in his flesh as he suffered and died on the cross, the law with its commandments and requirements. And then verse 16, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. I was thinking about what this means. It's like sometimes Paul can get quite complicated um, and you have to spend a bit of time thinking about what does he mean? What is he talking about? And I immediately thought of a saying that I like to use in my family. Jenna, my wife can vouch for it. And this is the saying I love to use. You might have come across it. I don't know if I made it up. But the saying is, never lend money to a friend. Give it to them as a gift. I think the gift part might be my, my, my contribution. I don't know. Please let me know afterwards. But there is that saying, never lend money to a friend. I think as Christians, we should, by grace, if we can afford it, offer it as a gift. And the reason why is because what happens when you lend money to a friend? It becomes a debt. It becomes something they owe you. And then all of a sudden, it starts cropping up every time you spend time with them. Oh, don't worry, Chris, I haven't forgotten. I, I just need, you know, a few things are going to come through and I'll start making the repayments. Oh, no, it's not a problem. Oh, no, I don't want you to think I can't pay it. I will pay it. And when they can't, guess what starts to happen? They avoid any contact with you. They stop wanting to talk to you. Why? Because there's this debt there is this something you owe them. You're not their friend anymore. You're the debt collector. And slowly but surely, it's not a friendship anymore. It's a financial arrangement. A wall has come up between you. A wall of disappointment, of a debt owed that may or may not be able to be paid. God's law was having the same effect on the Gentiles. It highlighted those rules and regulations, a debt of obedience and service, not only to God, but to other people. And their failure to pay that debt, what they owed, caused hostility and division. And it wasn't the commandments and regulations' fault. They were good. The problem was the people and their inability to give God or others 
what they deserve, what they are owed. When Jesus suffered and died on the cross, he not only paid our debt to God, we understand that one, we owe God something, punishment for the sins we've committed, he pays that debt, he also pays another debt, the debt we owe to each other. He fulfills on our behalf what we could not fulfill ourselves. And so we not only have peace with God through his sacrifice on the cross, we have peace with one another. And so Paul says that this wall of hostility and division, this separation between the Jews and the Gentiles has been removed. And so we, the result is verse 15. It is to create in himself Christ one new man out of the two, thus making peace. You could just as easily translate the one new man as a new human race. One that has never existed before. One that is unique, created in Christ. That's one of the great outcomes of what Jesus our Lord did, the creation of the church. And it is significant. It is important in God's plans and purpose. It's not just a side note. Oh, meanwhile, while I'm in heaven, I might just gather them together for mutual support. No, no. The church is very much part of the plan. It's very much part of what Christ came to do. The reason I know that is because of what I read in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 10. Because Paul goes on. This church is so significant, so magnificent, he spends a big part of chapter 3 talking about it. And this is what he says in chapter 3 and verse 10. God's intent, he's talking about all that Christ has done, everything that has happened. God's intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. This, this has cosmic significance. This um, goes beyond just our experience here and now, but affects all time, all rulers, all authorities. Think of it like this. I, I used to say, I used to have, I have all these sayings, you collect them as you get older. I'd, I'd put them down, but I couldn't call it the wisdom of Chris, no way. That's, didn't come from me, it came from someone else. But I used to have this saying that I worship the God of the 30,000 beetles. I thought there were 30,000 different species of beetles. I was wrong. I wasn't even close. I went, on, I went online, I better check that. I've been saying it for years, you know, the God of the 30,000 beetles. And, and I found out there are actually 350,000 species of beetles. Talk about overkill. That is a lot of beetles. And to think someone has to sit down and categorise all those species. That, the reason why I use that phrase is to draw attention to the creative artistry, the magnificence of God, the grandeur, the largesse of God. It doesn't create a handful of beetles. It creates 350,000 and we're still counting. He's an artist with great power, majesty and grace. And the church is one of his greatest creations. That's what Paul's saying. It was God's intent that now in the church that he should show his great manifold wisdom and power to the rulers and authorities. We are a wonderful work of God. And it is, as we see here in the verses that we've just read, a united church. It's meant to be a church without division. So we're, we're asking, well, okay, what is this church that God has created so magnificently through his son Jesus? It's the together church. 
not the divided, not into all these little different groups and categories, not into ranking ourselves, uh, you know, you're up there, so you deserve more attention, you're a nobody, you deserve no attention. No, no, no. We are the together church, where everyone is welcome, everyone is important. A church without division or separation. I see this unity and this togetherness in myself and at Hughes Baptist Church. Sometimes, but not always. Sometimes, but not always. The first characteristic of the church that Christ is building is togetherness. The second is Christ-centred. In verse 19, Paul goes on. Consequently, he's drawing it to a close now. We are this united church. He's now going to look about the foundations of this church, what this church is built on. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners, aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. And then he tells us an important feature of that household. It is, sorry, I missed that bit. It's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. It's built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, verse 20. I'll name a few of them. Matthew, John, Peter, Paul, James. They should sound familiar. We read and study their books. See, what they did was they recorded for us, I think this has died. Oh, they decided to skip. There we go. Sorry about that. I think we'll need to update the battery or we'll work, it. We'll work on it. Tech, you can see the flickering, technical details. Houston, we have a problem. Not quite. We'll get through. But we have the, with these apostles and, and they were given to us. They're the foundation on which the church is built. The prophets were moved, later on we learn, by God's spirit to give us God's word. Prophets like Luke and Mark. I think you can see where I'm going. The church is built on the foundation of the New Testament writers who recorded what Jesus said, achieved, led by God's Spirit, empowered by him. They explain how the church was formed, to be formed and to be God. That's why you spend each week looking at them. And when we look at the Old Testament, we always talk about it in view of what they wrote, what Jesus said. And central to everything they say is Jesus. He's the centre of it. It's always about him, what he has done, his place and important. As Paul goes on to say, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. I, I had to do a bit of research on that, that cornerstone idea. There's a picture of one. Next time I'm, I'm in the city or looking at buildings mostly older buildings, they've got to look for it. Apparently it was a very important stone that when they were building uh, these constructions, they, they would lay the cornerstone and that would be your guide. From that cornerstone, all the other bricks would be laid. The position of the building would be determined. It was the guiding stone for the rest of the building. And Paul is saying to us that Christ is the chief cornerstone, the chief guide, the chief measure when it comes to determining how we're going as a church and as it is built and as we strive to be the people he's called us to be. One of the temptations we face as a church, because we're an organisation of people, is that we follow the principles of the world rather than the principles of Christ. I'll give you an example where I've come across it. You might have your own. I'll give you two. The first one is I've noticed our world measures everything by numbers. I work in aged care, spend a lot of time with residents. You'd be amazed about the number of numbers we have to write down regarding residents. Mountains of it. Numbers everywhere. And this obsession with numbers and measurements creeps into the church. 
And so what we do, and I've noticed this pattern, I've seen it at conferences time and time again, we elevate the churches with the biggest numbers. They're the ones we want to listen to. They must be right. Why? Because they have big numbers. So we want to hear the pastors of those churches because they must have something really important to say. Because look, they have such big numbers. They must be doing so well. I don't know if they are or not. Then I come across how Christ, what, what he measures in a church and in people, and it's faithfulness, not numbers. Great example of that is this phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what Jesus will say to those that have served him with great dedication and faithfulness, well done, good and faithful. It won't say, well done, big numbers, Christian, you have so many numbers, well done. It's not going to say that. It's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Don't measure yourself by numbers. That's how the world does it. Measure by faithfulness. Here's another one. I've got quite a few. I thought I'd only give you two. Here's another one. The world values moral superiority. Moral superiority. So we pick and choose. This is, this is the temptation. We pick and choose the sins that we find easy to condemn in others, but that make us feel superior. And so we highlight particular groups of sins, sexual immorality. Well, that's obviously not what good people are going to be doing. The bad people do that. Drunkenness, addiction, free and easy lifestyles. It's called cherry picking. Going for the easy ones so that you can feel moral and superior. And churches condemn these sins in public. Crowds of Christians flock to hear their condemnation, while all the time ignoring the sins that affect good people, so-called good people, as well as bad people. You know the sins I'm talking about? Greed, pride, discrimination, self-centeredness, our lack of compassion for those that are struggling with their life without Christ. Imagine we're going to have a protest. We're going to get together. We're going to march through the streets and the banners will say, we're against being selfish and hateful and proud and our, the church's failure to show compassion to those who are in need. I'm not sure many would turn up for that protest. That's a problem, isn't it? Listen to what Jesus says and what he values. And we probably know the verse. It makes us feel uncomfortable. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? I see myself and Hughes Baptist Church following the principles of Christ. I see it. Sometimes but not always. The first characteristic of the church is togetherness. The second characteristic is that we are built... It may go, no, it's not going to go. Yep, Christ-centeredness. Maybe I'm getting some help down the back. Don't know. And then the third is spirit-filled. We are a spirit-filled church. Referring to Christ, and we're drawing this to a close now, referring to Christ, Paul writes in verse 22... In him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. That's what we share with the children. One of God's favourite places, dwelling within the church. And he does that through his spirit. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. All equally God. Each fulfilling different roles. The spirit fills and empowers the church. He is key to our relationship with God today. He gives us the ability to call God our Father, Abba Father. He makes 
the life that we live in Christ a reality. We can't do it without him. And this comes up again and again in Paul's letter. In chapter 3, a bit later on, he writes, The mystery of Christ has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. There it is again. The scripture that was written, provided by the Spirit. And then in chapter 4, he goes on and says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. See, we can't do anything without him. The church is not about human effort or strategy or planning. These will play a part. But ultimately, anything that happens in the church must occur through the work and power of God's Spirit working within us. So that means this is, this is not a human effort endeavour. It, it's part of it, but everything we do must be empowered and led by the Spirit. Now, I could see that happening in myself and in this church. I see it happening as we, we come to prayer and pray for things that are important and that are challenging us because we recognise that without the help of God and His Spirit, we can achieve nothing. I see it happening sometimes. But, but not always. Not always. I said in this message I would answer the question, can a person be a Christian without being a part of a local church. And I would, I would say you can't be a growing one. You can't be a faithful one. You can't be one that enjoys the presence of the Spirit. In fact, I would say it's like trying to be a baby without a family. Is it possible? Ooh, why would you? It's almost impossible. I want to finish with a, a wonderful speech. You might know it very well. And it was given by Martin Luther King 60 years ago. He's a Baptist minister. And he stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington and gave a, sp a famous speech to over 250,000 civil rights supporters. And this is part of what he had to say. I want, to, I want you to listen to the words because I believe, I know where Martin Luther King got his inspiration for that speech. This is what he, wrote, he said. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that my four children one day will live in a nation where they will not be judged by the colour of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day, down in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. Some might say an impossible dream. Oh, that's fantasy land. That's never, ever going to happen. Get real. That's not the world in which we live. And I don't agree. I don't agree at all. Because I've seen it. I've seen what Martin Luther King has dreamt for. I see it every time I come together and be part of Hughes Baptist Church. It's happening as we speak. God's people gathered together without division or discrimination of any sort, built on the foundation of Christ and empowered by the Spirit of God. I believe that's where Martin Luther got his inspiration. The church. That's how we're meant to be. This is my dream for Hughes Baptist. My dream for me, and I see it sometimes, but not always. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and thank you for a glimpse into what you are doing and what your plans are before us and before all the rulers and authorities. Help us to see the wonder 
the magnificence of this creation, the church, and help us to see our part in it, what we can be doing to bring about the togetherness, the Christ-centeredness, the spirit-filledness that we see in these verses. Challenge us, we pray, and help us to work towards that great dream, that great reality you brought about in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen.